Foundation. Thank you for joining us to this week's medical huddle. The huddle is facilitated by the Hospital Center Foundation as a way to share current information regarding the hospital's COVID-19 response. So if you're logged into WebEx, please join the chat by emailing your questions or comments. If you're called in and want to ask a question, please email to foundation at virginiahospitalcenter.com. We'll answer as many questions as possible after hearing from our two guests. So first, I'd like to reintroduce to everybody Dr. Jeff DeLisi. Jeff is the Chief Medical Officer of Virginia Hospital Center. But some people may not know that Jeff is also the Chief Medical Officer who's leading a statewide conference that was assembled to address COVID-19 across the Commonwealth. So Jeff, you have a unique perspective on how coronavirus, uh, uh, the coronavirus has impacted not only the Commonwealth, but also our DC metropolitan region. And so I know you're watching the numbers from across the river. If you take a look at that along with what's happening downstate, how do you balance those two dynamics as it relates to what we're doing here in our local community? Yeah, thanks, Tony, and, and thanks everyone on the call. So, um, you know, the, the current state of being at Virginia Hospital Centers, we still have about 80 people in our hospital that have COVID-19. Uh, so the numbers have gone down for the first time. We've really seen about a, about a week of some sustained um, decline, which is great to see, but there's still a lot. And I think when you look across the D.C. metro area, the, the experience um, – and what we've seen here has been much different than in other parts of the state or other parts of the Commonwealth of Virginia. Um, the prevalence of COVID, I think, remains much higher uh, in the D.C. metro area, in, in D.C. proper, in the sort of surrounding Maryland counties like Montgomery County, and then in Arlington and Fairfax County. In fact, uh, I think Dr. Modak was commenting earlier today that the numbers in Fairfax have continued to go up, although Arlington's seen a little bit of flattening. So, um, you know, I, I've seen articles that label D.C. as a hot zone. <laughs> So to speak, and I, I think that really is the case. Um, you know, when you look at the Virginia numbers, you're looking at the whole whole Commonwealth of Virginia, and it's a very different situation in different places. In fact, I was on a call with um, some of the leaders from Mary Washington earlier, and they, I think, have 20 to 30 patients in their hospital. So about, you know, less than half of what we have. And that's just going as far south as Fredericksburg. So then you go further south than that, they're seeing less and less. So uh, it's just... For, for whatever reason, I think it's just the population density of the D.C. metro area is a lot different than what it is in other parts of the Commonwealth. Um, with that higher population density comes higher prevalence of COVID. And uh, we're still seeing that here. And it, it's something that we continue to uh, need to pay attention to. You know, I'll say this isn't the time to let up on it. Um, we have to remain vigilant and uh, keep the social distancing and, uh, you know, again, try to try to get this to continue to go down. Thank you. Um, I wanted to follow that question up, Dr. DeLisi, with um, safety uh, here on campus. Um, we, we have um, started medical procedures, urgent and emergent procedures, um, over the last week or 10 days. Can you speak to um, how that's going um, as it relates to patient safety and also uh, taking care of the deferred medical needs of our community? Yeah. It's gone really well, Tony. Thanks for asking. So we're about two weeks in now from the governor's order expiring. We've almost done a full uh, complement of uh, procedures this week. Things are going to continue to ramp up, I think, over the next week or two, but we're already at 70, 80% of our normal capacity, which is great to see. One of the things that makes, I know a lot of doctors really nervous about what we've seen during this COVID crisis is just a complete drop off of normal day-to-day -day things like heart attacks that we stopped seeing. We don't think it's because people stopped having heart attacks. We don't think people have all of a sudden stopped getting cancers. People haven't stopped needing to get screening colonoscopies. People haven't stopped needing hip replacements. They were all just put on hold. And the reality is, uh, and I think, you know, Dr. Moda, I can certainly comment on this as well. This isn't going to go away next week. It's not going to go away next month. A vaccine could be some time off. And so we're going to be in this new reality where um, COVID is going to be out there. And we think we have the safest way to take care of patients having procedures. We're the only hospital in the area that is doing testing the day of. And why that's so important is if you go somewhere else and they say, hey, we're going to test you three days out. Well, the only thing that that test three days out is telling you is, did you have COVID three days before you came in? It doesn't mean you, didn't, you don't have it on that day. Um, it's just telling you something about what, what your status was in time three days prior to that. Um, I should comment on two other things. One, first related to safety, 
uh, we did some uh, analysis this week. And through this entire COVID crisis, where we've been taking care of upwards of 100 patients in our, in our hospital, having 50, 60 visits to our emergency room every day with patients with potential COVID, we have about 3,000 employees. We've had six people uh, test positive for COVID, probably due to, a patient, due to a patient exposure, six. So six out of 3,000 is 0.2%. We know that COVID is in, the prevalence of COVID in the community is 1% to 2%. So if you're in the community, the chance of getting COVID is 1% to 2%. If you're a staff member at VHC uh, taking care of COVID patients, it's 0.2%. So we think that we're providing the right protective gear, the right amount of protective gear to keep our staff safe, and that in turn keeps our patients safe uh, as well, which we're really, really proud of. Um, two other quick things I'll mention. One, um, some of you may have seen an article, you know, we talk a lot about the Abbott rapid test and there were some national articles about questioning um, the validity of the test results. So I can tell you the study that's being um, discussed, it used the Abbott test, same one that we're using, but they used two different techniques. One was they did what's called the nasopharyngeal swab, which is a very long swab that goes up through your nose several inches up. It's not just in your, your sort of nares, right, when you kind of enter your nose, but it's much, much further up. And, and honestly, it's a somewhat uncomfortable test. But one arm of the study did a nasopharyngeal, so a couple inches up, and then they put that swab in what's called viral transport media, which is a, a fancy word for this kind of weird solution that they, they put it in. Abbott had several weeks ago, several, almost a month ago, said, don't put the swabs in viral transport media. It doesn't, it doesn't produce accurate results. So we were never using that. And I'm not honestly quite, not even quite sure why they even tested that. The second thing they did is they used the Abbott rapid test and did a, a nasal swab. So again, we're using a nasal pharyngeal swab four inches up. In the test, they just use a nasal swab where they just swab very, you know, very, uh, very low in the, in the nose. We have actually tried to validate that. We wanted to be able to do that for patients because it obviously is more comfortable to just swab the nose than to take this longer swab and go up several inches. And we actually found that the accuracy was not as much with the, uh, with the nasal swab. And so we've only been using the nasal pharyngeal swab. So we, we think we're doing something very accurate. Our own data here and experience here shows that we're at about 90% sensitivity. So we're really proud of that. And, um, we just think it's a good test here and, and we continue to, to think it has great, great valid, validation and great results. Finally, I just wanted to share some other exciting news that we had this week in terms of uh, our outcomes and safety here. Um, we have uh, admitted over 550 patients now with COVID to our hospital. And we see that our mortality rate here is about 13%. So again, just speaking to the severity of this disease, 30% uh, of patients that admitted have, have passed away. But I was able to look in, in, in the EPIC database. EPIC is our electronic medical record. And we were able to look at 31 million lives in that database. And we found 7,000 admissions for COVID in that database. The mortality rate was over 21% for those 7,000 patients. And ours is 13%. So that 8% difference over 550 patients means that at Virginia Hospital Center, we have saved an additional 40 people at least because of the care that they're receiving here. There are 40 people walking around today that may not be walking around if they didn't get their care at Virginia Hospital Center. And so we've been really sharing that with staff and our medical staff this week. It's something we are really proud of. I couldn't be more proud to be part of this organization, to know that we're making that kind of difference for our patients. And I hope it makes all of you just as proud to be associated with us, to be have Virginia Hospital Center in your community. Um, but through the great work of people like Dr. Modak, through our involvement in the national trial, like the Gilead or Disappear trial, and through all the hard work of our staff, our nursing staff, our hospital staff, we've been able to save over 40 people, um, which is really just, uh, again, something I couldn't be more proud of. That's fantastic, Dr. Delisi. Thank you so much. So I think the takeaway is you want the brain tickler if you have to get the test uh, because it's more effective. And then secondly, being here on campus is more safe, is more safe than walking around in the general public. So I think that speaks to the importance of uh, patient safety and the safety of our employees. So this is a perfect transition to introducing our other guest this afternoon. Dr. Uh, Rohit Modak is our leader for infectious diseases here at Virginia Hospital Center. So Dr. Modak, um, 
If you could just give us maybe a quick peek back. We were about 60 plus days into this um, active phase here, uh, here in our hospital. And give us a couple takeaways as far as lessons learned from your perspective as a caregiver that's ending up in the great outcomes that Dr. Delisi already mentioned. Uh, thank you, Tony. Thank you for inviting me here. So when we think back to when this started, I mean, we were, we as a medical community were talking about coronavirus back in January when we first started hearing those cases coming out of Wuhan. And we realized it would be a problem in the United States by late January, early February. So I remember our first initial meetings with our public health department, with our emergency department, just saying, all right, are we prepared? If we start seeing patients here, how are we going to take care of them? And we taking care of pandemic patients before. I was here for H1N1 about 10 years ago for the Ebola situation in 2015. Um, but at that time, you know, we, we didn't really have Ebola patients. We had zero. There were not any who came into e emergency rooms in the United States. Um, we were prepared, however, and we did a lot of preparedness and planning. And we thought it would be very similar. We do the same kind of planning, not knowing what to expect. So we were having these initial meetings talking about how to isolate patients. And then as March came in, we saw what happened around the country, which started happening in Seattle, in California, and then in New York, and how everything was overwhelmed. And that was when we were just starting to have a first few patients. But the real challenge initially, 60 days ago, there was two things that was on everyone's mind. Number one, testing. How do we test patients? So I remember at first that uh, CDC did not offer tests. We went through our state health department, which could only do a few. We didn't have commercial tests available. And then the second thing was PPE, personal protective equipment, that even if we had patients coming in, if we could test them, how do we isolate them and keep our staff safe? We saw highlights, as I'm sure everyone remembers, in New York, where 30% of the hospital staff was out with coronavirus because they were being exposed. And that was a huge concern of ours. How can we take care of patients appropriately, but still keep our staff safe? So these were the biggest challenges 60 days ago, I would say. And as we went through it, I mean, a couple of things have happened. So first, as uh, Dr. Delisi spoke about, the rapid testing, the fact that we were able to secure the rapid test from Abbott Laboratories, and that changed things. We were able to diagnose people on the spot, and we were... I will, I'll say lucky enough, but I know it's not luck, it's the skill of the people who work here. We were able to secure a lot of tests such that we're able to test everybody, not just those who we think have coronavirus, but those coming in for procedures, those who are just being admitted to our hospital. That changed things. We, knew, we now know how, where to place patients, how to make our whole hospital safer because we can early identify these patients. Then in terms of PPE, I again can't say enough about our hospital, that we were able to to not just acquire PPE, but continue to acquire it. Not just to say, okay, we have enough for 10 patients, but we have enough for the next six weeks. We have enough for the next six months, potentially. We're still working on our sources that we're able to take care of our patients safely. And I mean, just as important as taking care of our patients, as I've mentioned, is taking care of our staff. And like Dr. Delisi mentioned, our staff generally are not getting sick. So we're able to protect them in the hospital. I feel so confident about our PPE that when I send a staff member, a doctor, a nurse, a technician, a respiratory therapist into a room, I'm confident they can protect themselves. They will not get coronavirus from the patient. We're identifying the patients, we're isolating them, we're taking care of our staff. So I feel really good about how it's progressed. What we didn't know, which I think is interesting, is really what is our capacity? So we're a 350 bed hospital or so. So we have the ability to take care of so many patients. Does that mean we can take care of 350 coronavirus patients? And what would that entail? And that was interesting to see develop over the last two months. So initially we had you know, a few, we had two or three, then we had 10 or 12, then we had 30 or 40, up until last week and the week before where we got up to over 100 patients. And we thought that initially it was a lot, we were devo uh, devoting a lot of resources to it and we could handle it. And I'll tell you, as we got close to 100 and over 100, it did stress our system. That although we had the bed capacity, it's not just that, it's, it's staff burnout. It's, it's changing your PPE. We call it donning and doffing, putting on, taking off all this protective equipment every time. It's exhausting, it's tiring. As you know, I, I love that we are better than average. I wish everyone was better than average. I wish 
you know, this wasn't such a fatal disease. Um, and it's, it's taxing. It's taxing on patients, of course, on families. It's taxing on healthcare workers. And it's draining. And, you know, we felt that the more patients we had, we certainly felt that pinch. And it's not just a matter of having enough ventilators or ICU beds, but just the em emotions that went into taking care of these patients that continue to go on is tremendous. And that, and that does stress us. And I think that's really going to be the challenge moving forward. Thank you, Dr. Malik. Um, and we can't be more uh, thankful to the community for stepping up. We've had countless uh, meals brought our way and signs and kids writing uh, chalked messages on the sidewalk. So we've been really glad to have the community step up and support this fine work. Um, I had one other question, and we're going to go over to some questions that have come in. This one's for Dr. Modak. So you talked a lot about what we've learned over 90 days, but I think there's already concern if you hear what's being discussed at the national level. Uh, we're going to have our uh, expected flu season come fall. I know it's coming because I get my reminder to get a flu shot every August right before Labor Day faithfully do it. So I know that's when the flu season is getting ready to start. So if you take in a traditional flu season, this speaks to your point about stress on the system. Traditional flu season and uh, that we still have uh, coronavirus present in the community. Um, what are we doing uh, to deal with that potential situation in the fall? So the potential is there to have this influx of patients that would be beyond what we could handle. Now, of course, we don't want it to get to that point. So like you said, the flu, we always get more patients during flu season. And the best thing anyone can do to prevent the flu is to get the flu vaccine. The flu vaccine works. It keeps people out of hospital. It attenuates the illness. It's something that's very important. So of course, we want to stress that. But some people are going to get the flu anyway. Our hospital admissions will go up. And we will not have vanquished coronavirus by any means in a few months. So what's very important is to continue what we're doing. How did how did we flatten the curve in Arlington and how is it flattening in certain areas of the country? And it's simple, it's social distancing and some areas are better at doing it than others. And some areas it's easier. It's, it's easier to do it in more rural areas than it is in cities like New York. Uh, and that's why we're seeing different rates of infection. We need to continue social distancing. I, so, you know, the CDC has come out with plans. The government has come out with plans. Um, Dr. Uh, Dr. Northam, our governor has come out with a plan, phase one, phase two, how to, reopen society. And frankly, those plans are wonderful. They make a lot of sense. I just hope we can stick to it. So the general idea is that as cases go down, then we can slowly open parts of society. Certainly things that are essential, like medical care, need to be opened right away. And as the cases go down, we can open up more and more. And we need to really stick to that and not just see on the media that there's some debate or, or people are tired of being locked up at home, so they want to go out and have a party. We need to be smart about things as a society. We need to take the words of the CDC, of Dr. Fauci. We need to stay social distance, continue to wear our masks when we're interacting with anyone. And if we can do that, I think this whole community will do much better. Very good. So I, I, we had a couple of questions that came in already. This one's for Dr. DeLisi. Said that Dr. DeLisi, you mentioned that patient volume is picking up at Virginia Hospital Center. Um, as a patient who will be coming in for a procedure, what should I do to prepare for my visit to the hospital? I don't think there's anything uh, really to, to do other than what your physician's instructions are. And just know if you're having a procedure, you will be tested for COVID when you get here. Um, so uh, uh, that's, that's sort of the only thing to know. We get the turnaround time is in about less than 30 minutes. But again, we've, we have done this for a couple of weeks now. And we've found a couple of patients who didn't have any symptoms and tested positive for COVID. And why that's so important is that although... When you're, if you don't have symptoms and you're positive for COVID, it doesn't mean that you're going to get so sick that you need hospitalization. It means there's a chance you might. You know, we're seeing it's about 15% of patients that have COVID end up needing hospitalization. Yeah. So again, 15% if you have COVID, 50% chance, 15, 1.5% chance that you need a hospitalization. But if you already know you have COVID and you've got that 15% chance of hospitalization, why would you want to go through having a big surgery and try to recover from that surgery? when your body might be getting really sick. And that's why it's so important to do that right on the day of surgery, get that test result back. And if you have COVID and the surgery can at all be delayed, to delay it until you get over the COVID and then we can bring you back in and do the, do the uh, procedure. Um, this, uh, uh, Dr. Delacy, this 
Um, actually, might be a question for Charles Fletcher, but he's not here, so I'm going to kick it to you. Uh, somebody was in the hospital yesterday. They saw that um, there was tapes across the chairs. Um, so could you explain why there's tapes across the chairs and why we probably need to respect that? Yeah, I mean, we, we've done that in some of our areas just to, again, promote social distancing, right? We don't, we don't want people sitting next to each other for your own safety uh, and the safety for everybody in the hospital. So we've just, we have just taped off some chairs so that people are, are not tempted to sit next to each other. And we make sure that there's social distancing uh, that's going on in our waiting rooms if people need to wait there. We're trying our best to not have any waiting rooms so we get you right back and get your procedure done and get you out of here. Um, thank you. This is a question for Dr. Modak. Um, Dr. Modak, do you think that we'll reach a point where everyone gets a COVID test? And then the second part of that is, um, uh, will it become ubiquitous where you don't have to have a prescription, but it's just maybe it's over the counter or something you can order and it gets delivered to your home and you do a home test? So uh, the short answer for both of those is yes and yes. I, I hope so. I think the first one, yes, you know, the hospital will continue to uh, source its vendors and try to get tests for everyone. The big limitation is that we don't have reagents. We can't buy enough testing. It's not that we don't want to test everyone. It's there's limitations that every hospital is competing for the same limited supply of tests and the government is deciding kind of where these go to. But uh, in the future, as they keep manufacturing more, I suspect we will have enough and we will want to test everybody who comes through. I think uh, commercially having these tests available makes a lot of sense that a patient can maybe get a mailed uh, package home, do a test themselves and send it back. Th that makes a lot of sense. I, I would love to see that happen. I think that's more of a, a government policy issue sure. than a medical issue, but yeah, that would make a lot of sense. Tony, I'll just, I'll just uh, add on to that as a sort of interesting anecdote. So today is uh, May 15th, right? And uh, I just said, like, I, was, I was giving a presentation earlier this week. So two months ago today, I believe it was a, a Sunday, May 15th or Sunday, March 15th. And on that day, the Commonwealth of Virginia had the capability to test 50 patients. That was it. No hospital could run their own tests. If you had a patient that you thought had COVID, you had to go through your county health department. It had to be approved that you were going to be able to test the patient. The sample had to be collected. It had to be sent to Richmond. You had to wait for somebody to pick up the sample, send it to Richmond. Richmond would run it. You'd get the result back in a couple of days. But Richmond only had the capability to do 50 total. And here we are two months later. And I can tell you at VHC, we can run 50 COVID tests from swab to results in one hour on patients here at VHC. Um, so it's just kind of mind boggling when you think where we were two months ago today and where we are today. I mean, it's just, it's unbelievable how much the system has ramped up. Uh, and I do think it's a great story of, of how the world has changed really quickly to, um, you know, accommodate what, what's going on with this virus. So, you know, to the question and to Rohit's response, I always keep thinking, well, if we got from point A to point B in two months and point C is two months from today, what is that going to look like? And, uh, you know, I, I share Rohit's, uh, Dr. Modak's enthusiasm that um, hopefully we're going to be two months from now, you'll get a kit at your home from Amazon and you'll test yourself and you can let us know if you're, you know, you're positive or not. So, uh, I hope things get a lot easier. We really do. Um, uh, the easier and more accurate we can test people, I mean, that's, that's better for everybody. The more testing we can do, the better it will be. So uh, I'm excited to see where we're at. You know, today's May 15th. Uh, excited to see where we're going to be at on, uh, you know, July 15th. That's great. That's a great point, Dr. DeLisi. I, I do want to remind everybody that this is National Hospital Week. So uh, if you have an opportunity to show your appreciation for uh, the fine medical team and support services folks that work here at Virginia Hospital Center 24 7, 365. Please go to www.bhcfoundation.com forward slash COVID 19. Make a gift in honor of these fine people that are keeping us safe and keeping us healthy. Um, so, this will conclude our uh, uh, huddle for this week. Our next huddle will be on June 18th. It, in fact, will be uh, a, a full briefing. Uh, that will include uh, Mr. Cole, our CEO, and we'll be taking a virtual tour of the new construction that's going on on campus. So I encourage you to join us on Ju June 18th. Be looking for an invitation in your email box. In the meantime, please, I'm asking everybody, stay safe, stay healthy. Goodbye.